Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Sander Hodge of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Uh, today I have a special colleague, uh, Kate Collins, with us today. Hi, Kate. How are you today? I'm well. Nice to see you, Roxanne. So Kate um, has been in the leadership roles uh, in training and development for quite a while in consulting. And Kate and I kind of, our worlds seem to collide often um, mm -hmm. between uh, our speaking worlds and some of our, um, we're currently both writing books um, in a writing group. Um, that's how we've kept our heads above the water, I would say, mm -hmm. um, during the COVID times. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kate, and then we'll jump right into some of the things that we want to talk about. So Kate's the CEO of a, a company called Powerful Journey Consulting. Uh, she's a former burned out leader. So she has the real life on the, on the boots uh, kind of experience with, with an extensive counseling background who lost her, uh, her way a long time ago. Um, her mission is to guide or to support leaders and their teams to be more resilient. And as you know, that's what I chat a lot about. So that's why this alignment was really good with Kate. Uh, to be courageous and confident by rediscovering what's their powerhouse, what's within them. And she's been f facilitating transform transformative, transformative, I can't speak today, Kate, leadership and team retreats for about 15 years. So you've been doing this for quite a long time. And what, what a time uh, that we're recognizing that's being needed even more so um, in, in the corporate uh, worlds that we live in. Her keynotes, training, and consulting truly connect with her audience at a heart level because of her authentic, playful, and high-impact strategies. And I can tell you, I've spent, I think, almost four months with this lady. She's mm -hmm. always on point with her energy. And she oh, always turns her I see every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Framework, which she's developed, um, has traveled. She's traveled the world and talked about that framework with senior leaders and their teams. Worked with the U.S. Army, Army, Ontario Shores Mental Health, uh, International Associations, Ministry of Health, not not for profits and other organizations. Um, Kate's the powerhouse in you. How to le lead with greater resilience, courage, and confidence. Book will be released. There's an actual date. I know. October. I didn't realize there was a date. Yes. Way to go. That's awesome. Thank October you. 22nd. Yes, thank so everybody you. Everybody that's um, going to enjoy our interview, which I know will, a lot of people will, uh, you know that you can look out. And I'm sure Kate will be sending out some stuff that I will also be pushing out when her book um, is released. Then you can grab a hold of her book. So Kate, let's obviously you and I, Kate and I have a lot of parallels, um, her clinical background, my clinical background. I talk a lot about authenticity. She talks about that, harnessing that power within. And we have so much to talk about leaders today because uh, leadership roles um, are under the microscope even that much more today. And people have to be more flexible. And compassion was always something that we know that leaders needed to have, but now there's no kind of negotiating with that. It's being dictated to. And um, so let's talk a little bit about what leaders have to do in this time. And I'm sure a lot of leaders are already doing it. And some need to maybe pivot how they, um, they kind of are more flexible and compassionate with their environments. Well, I think first and foremost, I'm a firm believer, Roxanne, that it, it starts with us and ends with us as leaders. So what do I mean by that? So my book is really as a result of, again, me being a recovered burnout leader and being able to help people to be, create success habits that help them to get grounded, get themselves centered so that they can, in fact, show up and be the best version of themselves. The tragedy is in our culture today is it's backwards. So we have it where the leader then kind of does the, okay, no, I'll take time now. I'll take a day off. I'll take a week or whatever. But by then they are so exhausted and so depleted. So I'm a huge fan of it starts with us and ends with us, meaning that we need to make sure that on a daily basis that we're doing things that are going to in fact support our well-being, our resilience for the long haul. 
So I think that's number one. I think also that, you know, we know that we want to be a power of example and not a warning. So the leaders that I work with are, you know, primarily in organizations. I know yours is corporate. Mine is not. Um, Mine tends to be more with not-for-profit, it's mental health organizations, hospitals, that kind of thing. And so for myself, what I have found is that sometimes we've lost sight because everybody's so exhausted mm-hmm. of that, wait a minute, is what I'm about to say or is what I'm about to do going to be a power of example or in fact, will it be a warning for my team? So I agree with what you were saying earlier wholeheartedly, Roxanne. All eyes are on the leader more than ever. This mental health uh, you know, we've got a crisis on our hands more than ever during this pandemic. And I think it was there before and now it's become amplified. And I think that it's really, really important that again, we start with ourselves as leaders and then go outwards. So we know that the cost of mental health, um, you and I were both looking up the stats prior to getting on it. The mental health uh, cost in Canada is $50 billion. That's, that's staggering. When I looked it up and then you said it at the same time, I'm like, my goodness. And that's in, they figured that in 2011, that was, um, you know, 2.8% of our GDP or gross domestic domestic product. So that's super, super high. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, it's interesting because I think when you say mental well-being people think mental health and i often say i don't know if you would agree with this it's a spectrum right i mean we all gone to the days where we're gonna you know go somewhere and maybe um you know have repetitive strain it's it's not that it doesn't happen but really what we're do, using more than ever now is our brains yes i agree right? I totally and agree. leaders especially because when we hire leaders we expect a certain caliber mm-hmm. from them mm-hmm. And, you know, if you think of uh, kind of the MBA schools and stuff like that years and years ago, you know, those leaders that were going through those programs, they really weren't talking about the soft side of things, which Mm -hmm. is really what you are talking about and what I talk about with authenticity and leadership. So when we look at the numbers, that's high. Obviously, if, if our population at large or teams are and are in such distress, the leaders they're, they're also dealing with that on an ongoing basis. And the wear and tear on them is absolutely huge. I agree, Roxanne. And I think that, you know, there was a time not too long ago, maybe even 10 plus years ago, where, you know, employees were encouraged to check out their personal life at the door. Check it at the door. We don't bring it into the work. And so now it's this integrated self that's coming into the workplace. So before where the, you know, we were just touching as leaders on, yes, for sure, be, be that support person, be that guide. Now it's, you know, they're being trained in how to coach them. Uh, it's just a whole different kettle of fish for leaders. And I think that having that constant awareness is really, really important because I'm seeing now where teams are, it's like a back and forth. It's like a ping pong match. Mm-hmm. And so you know, you've got the leaders that are stressed because their, their teams are stressed and then vice versa. And I think that sometimes we really need to simplify, you know, what's happening? Why are we here? Because I really am a huge fan that emotions destroy intelligence that, you know, if people aren't taking care of themselves, if they're not doing that self-care, if that's not part of the culture, and ultimately that's you know, where I work with leaders and teams is what sort of culture do we have? Is this one where we're excited about that we want to share with other people or where are there some gaps where in fact, can we, you know, uh, do a better job at communicating, you know, how we feel or communicating with each other about, you know, what's happening within our organization. I think like anything, there's strengths in every organization, there's strengths in leaders, there's strengths mm-hmm. in teams. However, we all need to have that, that place before retreats were a real luxury. Now yes. it's, it's, it's a given that people know that this is part of the prevention plan that, and you know, we can do retreats virtually. It doesn't have to be in person. Uh, and so that's where the difference is now. I think the volume has been turned up on saying we need to deposit into our teams more than ever before. We need to deposit into our senior leaders uh, because if we don't, as you were saying, the stats are so staggering. 
Mm -hmm. We're going to pay for it one way or the other. It's going to be on the front end or the back end. Absolutely. And, you know, when you're looking at, you know, the bottom line, if you're having, you know, if you're, if your days, if you're, you know, your incidental absences are on the increase, if your short term disability claims, I mean, that would be staggering to look at the stats now with everything that's going on. And then to also think about who's being left behind, the people that are staying after there's been uh, downsizing or layoffs with maybe people returning you know, these are people that are having to, to kind of hold on to the ship to keep it afloat and the pressures that those leaders and even those teams are experiencing, we could see how much more of a pressure cooker that those environments are in. Absolutely. I remember, in fact, I mentioned this in my book, Roxanne, one of the leaders that she had hired me to do an event, uh, it was a conference. And so we're on the treadmill. She's on the treadmill. I'm on the treadmill. And she's beside me at the gym. And she said, Kate, I've decided that's it. I'm giving my, my notice. I'm retiring. And I said, that's wonderful. I'm so happy for you. And she said, but catch this. And I said, what? And she said, they're actually hiring a total of three people for my position. Yes. So I think at some point, that's one of the things I talk about in my Emotionally Fair Room is that the reality is you may never get it all done. You may never get it all done. And so we have this misconception. If I just work harder and I try harder and I do this and I do that. And I'm not saying don't strive to be the best. Of course, I, I, I'm all about that. However, at some point we have to ask ourselves, is this even realistic? What's being asked of me? And where do I feel I can own my power and kind of give a little bit of a push and set a boundary? Or where, in fact, do I just have to, in my own mind, say, you know what, this is the best. This is the best I can do given the circumstances, given the crisis that I'm, you know, the various crisis that my team are enduring right now, uh, whether it's amalgamation, accreditation, whatever it may be, then that's where we need to start to do more of a, like open up our lens, see more of a, what I call the eagle's view and be able to get more of a sense of what am I capable of doing? What is my team capable of doing given the current climate? For sure. So you talked, okay, you started in, now Kate's book is based on a framework of the four rooms. So we, I've been learning about these, over, these rooms over the month. So you touched a bit about um, the rooms. So let's talk a little bit more about that because I think that's, you know, I talk a lot about awareness and being connected to your values and, you know, how, how do you stay authentic? And so you already start to talk to that, right? Because oftentimes we tell leaders, you know, get, get stuff done. Get, you know, when I was, you know, leaders in def, different, you know, I remember thinking, my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to get this done. Right. And I would get it done. And oftentimes there was nothing left when I would come home to my family and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you have the emotionally fit room, which is mm -hmm. what you're saying. It's, it's listen mm -hmm. and listen. And if you are consistently depleted, there comes a point where don't sit in the dark and kind of do the extra hours and, and grin and bear it. Cause at some point you're going to run out of steam and that's going to affect your emotional health. Um, what are the other rooms in your book and how kind of how should leaders kind of think about it as they get ready to read your book? Um, you know, even now, if they're sitting there and thinking and listening to what you're saying, tell them about the rooms and what, how they should think about it. Absolutely. So why don't I maybe backtrack just a little? So one of the things, for example, many, many years ago, these are earned. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> probably now about 20 years ago. I can remember relocating actually to a different area, the area in which we reside now. We've been for several years. And I ended up going to a meditation class. And I remember um, this really amazing indigenous man that I met. And he just had this calmness. Have you ever met somebody, Roxanne, that mm -hmm. just has this peace and calm about him? And I was feeling like, oh my gosh, I've got to reinvent myself. You know, here I've come into a new area and this is what I do. This is my livelihood. And how do I get myself out there? And he said, you know, Kate, in our tribe, we believe very strongly that in order for us to own our power, to step into that power, in order for us to have a sense of balance in our lives, in order for us to be able to live in our purpose, we must enter each of these four rooms every day. So mm -hmm. he went into saying that you're, you're mentally your mental room, your emotional room, your physical room, and your spiritual room. And it just like a light bulb went off. And I thought, yes, this is so simplistic, but so often it's the 101 things that really make the difference for us. So being a certified Pilates instructor, we talk a lot about, for example, engage your core, which we sometimes refer to as your powerhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so from there, uh, it's really in the powerhouses from within you 
then I thought, wait a minute. So, you know, entering your mental room doesn't really have the feel that I wanted, but what about if it was a mentally fit room? That already is the end in mind that, yes, I don't want to just walk into a mental room because that has a different connotation. <laughs> kind of like a bit of a, okay, like a padded room maybe. <laughs> Very white. And you might look good in white. <laughs> it may not be the look you're looking for. So for me, it was about the mentally fit room, your emotionally fit room, your physically fit room, and your spiritually room. So I've actually been using this model in all of my training that I do, my keynotes, my facilitation, my retreats. Mm -hmm. coaching because it's made such a big difference for people it just allows them to take their filter and go okay so Kate's saying each and every day in order for me to show up and be the best version of myself to be focused to be balanced to be able to be anchored in who I am I simply need to enter and check in to each of those rooms every day now I'm not naive we're all pretty busy uh, particularly leaders so it's as simple as if you walk into your, your check into your mentally fit room, it may be as simple as one of the things I talk about a lot is about how you start your day shapes your day. Mm -hmm. How you start your day shapes your day. So I mentioned it's called the power of four morning routine or practice. And so it's, you know, maybe start off with five minutes of meditation. If you can do 15, great. Uh, five certainly is a great coming out of the gate. That's a great number. Mm -hmm. But just getting yourself still allowing yourself to get still. So often what happens is a lot of people jump out of bed, they're intravenously hooked up to the caffeine um, because they need to get you know, that Kickstarter for their day. However, if they start their day in a much more relaxed, calm way, even if that means they have to you know, get up five minutes early, uh, but just allow themselves to maybe find that chair in their bedroom or somewhere. Maybe if they want to lay down, they can stay in their bed. But just that five minutes of getting with their breath, just quieting their mind. The second part of that mentally fit room is really being able to then get up and move their body. It may be just that they're going to stretch. And maybe they're going to do some yoga. Maybe they're going to go for a walk or hit their home gym or go for, you know, to the, the gym that they've, they've got a membership. During that time, I find it very helpful that when my clients are actually physically moving their body, I encourage them to also do a reflection of their successes. So here they're building that, that muscle, you know, at the gym or in their Pilates or their yoga or wherever. And so that's a great time to also flex the muscle of their confidence. What tends to happen for a lot of leaders is that it's next Next, next, it's like we're checking off the boxes mm -hmm. of all the things that we've got accomplished. However, we haven't paused to go, wow, that's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Look what I just accomplished over here. Yes. And so that allows us to then start to own that more and again, deposit into our confidence. The third part of that power of four is really about allowing ourselves to get into the gratitude attitude. And, and, I, and I call it an attitude because not only is it an opportunity to reflect on the specifics of, yes, I'm very grateful for my home, you know, while we're shut in for pand the pandemic, or I'm very grateful for this relationship and that's why, or whatever the case may be. It's also an opportunity to take that into your heart and feel it and then say, who now am I going to put that into action with? Who can I put up a mirror with them and say, hey, you know what? I just wanted you to know, I really appreciate you. Mm -hmm. I make the reference, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Avatar. Uh, my husband yes. took me uh, kicking and screaming to go because I thought I'm not into this sort of stuff. <laughs> I'm just not into it. And then of course I went and then had to buy the movie when it came out. But I love that they talk about, I see you. And mm -hmm. so, you know, part of the gratitude attitude is really staying in that, that, that moment. I call it the, you know, uh, sanity is in the pause. And really being present and saying to that person, you know, I really value this and you thank you. Uh, and particularly as a leader, you know, that's something, that's a great success, success habit to be doing every day. Who today will I maybe impart that with, that wonderful mm -hmm. compliment or that validation? And the final one, of course, is really being able to get clear about how do I want to show up today? What's my intention? Mm -hmm. So I've got, you know, eight different meetings I've got to go to. What is it that I want to do? How do I, how do I want to leave that meeting? And also, what do I want that those around me to experience from me during that meeting? 
Um, so then, so that's checking into your mentally fit room, your emotionally fit room. We talked about that. And I know your book is, which I'm excited to read your book is all about heart centered leadership. And mm -hmm. I'm all about that as well. And I, I'm so excited that you you're using that, uh, because it's really, really important. And I think that more than ever leaders need to have support. Mm -hmm. You know, the very first thing, the leaders that I work with, and I'm sure you can relate with the leaders you work with Roxanne. They say to me, Kate, the first thing to go is I cancel my lunch. The first mm -hmm. thing to go is that call with that one friend or my confidant mm -hmm. or my mentor. And that's the very thing we need during that time of upheaval. Maybe shorten it. However, yeah. we still need to have that touch point because it, that human connection is so very important. And as leaders, they deserve to have that, that support uh, more than ever. Then, of course, we've got the, I'm kind of doing a drive-by here. I always joke and say, do we want fries with that order? But, um, <laughs> then the third one, of course, is that, you know, your uh, physically fit room. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge fan of we need to move our body. Like, to sure. be transparent, Roxanne, I have just found the last two, three weeks, I got off. Like, I got off of the, the regular routine of, you know, hitting the gym three times because now we're back doing the gym. And, you know, I, I got away from it because I allowed my days to get too busy again. And yes. so, yes, I was walking, but it was more like a let's get yeah. it done walk, you know, rather <laughs> it's than... It's off that list. It's off that list. Right? Of... <laughs> right? Rather than yes. let's, let's just embrace nature, connect with Mother Nature and be, it was like, oh my gosh. So, but I felt it, like the fatigue. And I thought, what's going on? Like, and then I do that reflection of, okay, so how have I been eating? Sugar is a huge culprit. I honestly think that sugar should be up there with tobacco and alcohol. Yeah. Um, I really do feel we're a, a sugar addicted society and myself included. I have to really be mindful of that, particularly when I, I'm under a lot of stress. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think for sure, creating routines, like it's a routine to, to exercise. It's a routine not to exercise. And there's a perfect example for the last two weeks or so. I had gotten off my routine and that's where I was getting the energy. I was getting right. the focus, my creativity was coming up. Mm -hmm. And then the final one is your spiritually fit room. I think this is the foundation. This is the foundation of all of our houses, as far as I'm concerned. And that is, you know, what brings you joy? You know, mm -hmm. oftentimes people come to me and say, Kate, like, I, I just feel like I've lost my passion. I've lost my joy. I've become a human doer instead mm -hmm. of a human being. And so then I talk to them about, you know, you know, what does spiritual mean to you? Maybe it's God, maybe it's higher power, maybe it's being of service, whatever mm -hmm. that looks like. But I think, again, it can get lost when we're so busy trying to check off, you know, that things to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's really ultimately what, what the book is about and the work that I do is helping people really, in essence, remember the power of who they are. Right? right. And why they, you know, I talk a lot about, you know, when you look at some of the values that you bring forward as a leader, where did they come from? Yes. And to story about that. And I, you know, I was actually right with this morning when we were writing and I was writing about, um, you know, reflecting on differences in coaching. And I said, I remember my, my grand, my dad, I had, a, I have a 13 year young, my sister's 13 months younger and we looked like twins and um, you know, and we would get into conflict. I was the chatterbox. She was the quiet one. So, uh, you know, I was always kind of dominating her and getting in trouble. And so he, my dad thought, let's have these two sit down with their grandma. And she, I was telling the story in, in my writing saying, you know, it was so her delivery of, what she was trying to create with us was that we are as different as the sizes we were going to be. So I'm a little bit of a peanut and she's like five foot nine and she could tell when we were young and it was just that she didn't go after us having the bickering, but she was just talking about what, what my gifts were and what my sister's gifts were. And I thought, you know, that's, that's part of my leadership story because in, in reality I was looking there and I thought, where did one of my first leadership uh, stories come from and it was about learning about that you have to recognize differences and you know look at the strengths within those differences mm -hmm. I love that and, you know so it's it's it you know just again it, you know that reflective part like I said that weren't being taught um, and hopefully I would think that with new leaders being trained today that that becomes something that be, becomes very very vital 
because when you sit down and then I, you know, when I reflect on that story and I, for some reason, that's one of the stories I remember. And she had gone as as she was even looking at the length of her little arms. And she said, you know, Roxanne, look at your arm. And my sister's name is Charlene. She says, look at Charlene's arm. And Charlene's arm was quite lengthy compared. She goes, just like she's going to be very long and lean, you're going to be shorter and petite. And that being said, something as, as simple as that, I, I can remember as a little girl and then thinking as we had to get along as two young sisters, um, you know, what, what that involved, right? So going back to that space, like you said, you know, why is it that you lead in the way you do? Why do you do what you do? Why did you yeah. find that passion? Like you said, whether it was in nursing or, you know, to help others like we did, you know, in, in the helping field, mm-hmm. I think a lot of times leaders get lost, like to your point, because there's so much to do and then they get depleted and then they, they kind of lose their way uh, when it comes to burnout. Well, I love your story because I think it is really important that we get, we take that time to reflect and do that self-examination of what made me do what I do. I mean, in the book, I talk about really what is your leadership vision statement, because that's what's going to be your lighthouse. That's going to mm-hmm. keep you focused. And I, and I love what you're saying in that story because there's so many different pockets to it, right? Because one of the lenses I use, and I'm sure it's quite similar to yours, is that I talk to teams particularly about whatever, I mean, you think of the number of hours that people spend, you know, together in a team Mm -hmm. and or at work, it's, you know, sometimes even more than their own families. So I use that family systems lens and say, okay, so guess what? Whatever's unfinished back here from your family (laughs) of origin, guess where it's going to get played out and be triggered. But in the workplace, I remember working with two, I remember, the CEO come, having me come in, he said, I think you have to put on black and white stripes. And I said, what do you mean? I said, because I think you're going to have to do some serious refereeing with these two. <laughs> and um, I said, okay, let's just see how this works. So I met with them separately and it was so evident to me, they were triggering each other. And I said, I'm just curious. I said to the one, where are you, you know, did you feel this kind of intensity towards someone? Because they were really as managers their behavior was truthfully very childlike. And I'm not saying that the CEO said that. And it was really creating a lot of habit within their teams because they felt they had to in, uh, kind of cheer for their, their own manager. And, you know, and the gossip was rampant and it was just mm-hmm. really unhealthy. And so when I spoke to the one in particular, I said, where have you felt this intensity? And he said, oh, my brother. He was a jack. I won't say what the other part was, but you know, he was a jack, you know what? Um, And he just was so dominating and he was this and he was that. Ah, okay. So then we were able to work through, you know, that unfinished business. So then she could see that she was projecting on and she was getting triggered because there was some little nuances uh, that this other manager, and who wasn't male, by the way, uh, and so I know you and I both know that, that it doesn't matter the gender, doesn't matter the culture, doesn't matter anything. It's the fact that, you know, it, the intensity is similar to that of a family environment. And so the other was saying, oh my gosh, she reminds me of my mother. She's a perfectionist. She never, ever compliments me on what I've done. And so we were, then I was able to bring the two of them together after they did their individual. And it was unbelievable how they were able to see where they, in fact, um, were, you know, brought this, what strengths they brought to the, t- the, the table, but also where they were the weak link and how they were allowing their old story to, in fact, interfere with this current relationship. And mm-hmm. those two went on to be such good friends and such allies. However, I think it's a really important uh, component when it comes to teams is that being aware that sometimes people's reaction, and you're thinking, whoa, like out of 10, that was a thousand. It's because it's not current day. You know, mm-hmm. something's being triggered in them. And right. that's where the work is. You got to get to the source of what's happening here. And that's what strengthens teams. That when that leader, that fearless leader, and I do refer to them as the parent <laughs> uh, at times that, you know, that again, making sure that you're coming from a fair place, making sure that you're listening to both sides, making sure that you're not, you know, reacting to what's happening or overreacting, I should say, uh, and just seeing that, okay, it's very evident that this doesn't fit the circumstance. So let's get to the, the source of what it is, but creating that safe place most importantly, whether Absolutely. they hire somebody or they do it themselves um, to, to allow that to unfold. So that concept of powerhouse is so, um, so appropriate in that context, because 
we expect the leaders to be to a higher level. So if they get wrapped up in the storm and they don't see their role, Mm -hmm. because potentially the leader is being triggered, you know, by maybe some Mm -hmm. little subsets that get creates in teams. And then if you're not aware and you're depleted and you're in that context, you're going to get, you know, I often say you get batting in, you're on, you know, you're in one play over here and then you're being pulled over here. Um, so that awareness of going back to your power center, like you're talking about, becomes very valuable because you're, gonna, you're, you're staring the ship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I think, again, it goes back to how am I caring for myself as a leader? Because now what happens is what happens outside of me, I don't feel I need to have this, you know, we say wearing your heart on your sleeve. We know that you have a son, I have a son. It's just like your heart's there now. <laughs> it's not going anywhere else. It's right there on your sleeve. And I think for me, it's, being able to then, uh, if I'm taking care of me, if I'm getting my sleep, if I'm eating healthy, if I'm moving my body, if I'm getting my support, if I'm doing all the things I need to, to be more resilient, then what happens is I'm able to see things for what they are and detach and not feel like I've got to jump in there. However, like you said, I could be part of that problem as a leader. I could be also being triggered. And so that therefore, you know, having that space to work with your coach, having that space to st- take a step back, I call it step off the stress treadmill and have that confidant or that mentor be able, you know, you just be able to just share mm-hmm. and know that they kind of can hold up a mirror and go, this is what I'm getting. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's so vitally important. That eagle view, like you said, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're able to, you know, uh, keep yourself at that level of health based on your four rooms. Yes. And then what you can recognize within others when they're kind of out of, out of their powerhouse as well to guide them in a way that allows you not to be reactive. Cause all, all it takes, right. Is one or two, you know, yes. mishap as a, as a leader. And, and then, you know, you crush that concept of trust because you've acted badly because you're depleted. Mm-hmm. And then now, okay, how do I, I'm not sure how to back up now. Because I, you know, because my team has now judged me, and then I get I look like I'm aligned here or there. So, it's mm-hmm. it. I think you, what to your point, that balance is so important. I'm just curious. Um, where do you of all the rooms, where do you find that a lot of leaders fall down the most? Mm, okay, it's a toss up. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, it's a toss up. I, I have to say that some. It, Yeah. I mean, yeah, it really is a toss up because a lot of them stay in their head a whole lot. And Mm -hmm. so that mentally fit room is such whereby they have, like it impacts their sleep. So it impacts physically because now they've got the racing mind syndrome. And, oh, I should also mention too, that anybody that's watching this, they are welcome to go to my website, www.katecollins with a C uh, dot com or powerfuljourney.com. And if you go to my resources page, currently we have a complimentary playful for the, um, sorry, uh, playful meditation for the busy mind MP3. So okay. it's one of the things I wanted to give back to people because right now so many folks are struggling. And uh, so, yeah, so I, it, it's a good question because I, I have to say, um, I would say that a chunk of my leaders, they say when I work with them, that it's the physically fit room is the first thing to go when they're under a lot of stress. Uh, and also with that goes their healthy eating habits. So then they, mm-hmm. they get tired and then they eat whatever, you know, is there. Uh, but I have to say probably it's be- uh, between the mentally fit room and the physically fit room, I'd have to say. Yeah. Because I think that what happens is that like one of the things I talk about in the book, because statistics state that actually leaders have less sleep. They have less sleep than the average person. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? Well, it means then that they're more, they can be, can be prone to being more cranky, more reactive, uh, and somehow being able to create a little bit of undue uh, challenge perhaps when they're t- within their team that they may be completely unaware of. And so, again, one of the things I even go so far as saying in, in the physically fit room when we talk about sleep deprivation is really around, you know, if you know very visibly or you know because team members have shared that they're not getting a lot of sleep, whatever, it's time change, it's because of the pandemic, it's because of the current crisis that either globally or even within the organization, then having that conversation, calling out the elephant in the room and saying, you know what? now really isn't a good time for Mm -hmm. us to make this decision. My suggestion is we table this to the next meeting. Let's all be really mindful of getting our sleep. And because really what tends to happen, there's a, there's a method I use or I share with people, Roxanne, it's called halt. You know, when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or you haven't had exercise, someone shared that with me. 
And um, I loved it yeah. because I thought, I love this. This is fantastic. So, you know, take care of those first. So if I'm hungry, eat. If I'm angry, I need to remove myself from the current situation. Why? Because emotions destroy intelligence. If I'm lonely, I need to reach out to that mentor. I need to hire that coach or get that emergency, you know, meeting with my coach. You know, T, if I'm tired, okay, I need to get some, some sleep tonight or my team needs some sleep because we're not going to make a really good decision right now. Our emotions are going to run riot. We're not going to, we're going to kind of nitpick and gossip's going to run rampant. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to kind of look at things very differently. I feel in this current time more than ever. And it, to some degree, I think um, it's like a diagnostic or, or a pulse mm -hmm. uh, that you'd be taking of those meetings to get a sense. And you know your teams, right? Like mm -hmm. I've ran teams at, at, as well. And you're thinking, oh, boy, this is what this we're off there. You could kind of feel it like the energy in the right. room. And then to sometimes say to your point, say, OK, pivot to away from something, focus on what what you potentially collectively think they need. Mm -hmm. And then to, 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 to say, OK, we need to do X, Y or Z so that we can kind of focus as much as possible. Possible. Now, let's talk a little bit about your book. Um, so again, the, the name of the book is The Powerhouse in You, How to Lead with Greater Resilience, Courage, and Confidence. Help leaders and their teams cope more effectively. So how, how, is, how will the book help people um, be more resilient and cope more effectively and get that peace of mind that you've been, you know, kind of alluding to throughout the interview? Oh, great question. So really, the book is not just a book. It's also, in many ways, I've, I've made it a workbook. I've combined it. You know, as you know, with our writing group, it's just like, just write, just write. So for me, I just wanted to pour out as much as I could. You know, part two, the second book will be really what will be the feedback people were saying, oh, I really want you to delve more into this area. So I wanted to lay out the buffet um, of, of various uh, exercises. So number one, what will happen is they will know that they're not alone. So through the stories that I share with, with some of the dilemmas or experiences that other leaders have gone through, they will clearly be able to identify with some of those challenges that they face and how they overcame them. Uh, the second thing is they will be giving some very concrete strategies on, you know, well, how do I even know whether uh, I'm resilient or not? So there's, there's going to be quizzes, there's going to be opportunity, there'll be resources they can tap into to be able to help with that self-awareness. I'm with you about the self-awareness. I, I call it the AAA, you know, it's acknowledgement, mm -hmm. it's about, you know, being able to accept that, you know, you're doing the best you can with what you have. And then final A is action. So what am I going to do different now to get a different result. And I think mm -hmm. that for me, what they're going to do is they're going to be able to even use some of the exercises I'm giving and some of the strategies, they can use them in their teams. So it can yeah. be at a team meeting, they say, you know what, from this book from Kate's, I think that this might be something that would be really valuable that we do the, the mission statement together, the vision statement, the leadership, because mm -hmm. we're all leaders, whether we have the title or we don't have the title. Uh, I'm a firm believer that we're all leaders. So I think from, there's no question. They will feel some commonality. They'll feel a sense of, oh, I'm not alone. Yay. Uh, yeah. I'm not the only person that second guesses myself. I'm not the only person that experiences guilt or maybe perfectionism. And that now they've got something that they can kind of add to that toolkit and be able to make some changes. Awesome. It sounds amazing. Well, I can't, October 22nd. Yeah. I got to remember, I got to put that in my day timer. I'm sure you'll be uh, doing some launches and stuff like that, uh, that people might want to uh, get involved with. Kate, this has been amazing. Um, uh, what have I learned? I've learned that, you know, those rooms, to think about those rooms. And, uh, you know, I talk a lot about heart-centered leadership, which emotional, the emotional part of your leadership is key. But, you know, it's like, it's, it's like those, you know, those Rubik's cubes that you, you know, when they, they get so out, out aligned that you can't put them back together. But if you kind of consistently think um, emotionally how I'm feeling, um, psychologically, what, what are my thoughts like? How's my body feeling? And kind of, you know, like you said, what, what's the bigger picture for me? Why do, why does Kate Collins do what she does? And what, why does mm -hmm. Roxanne or Hodge do, you know, when you, when you don't stop and reflect in those things and to your point where you said earlier is we're, we're checking off these lists after a while, we kind of forget why we started doing what we started doing years and years ago. So to really reflect on those things and think, you know, um, if you're, if you're wanting to learn more about that, absolutely. Um, Kate, um, there's a contact that you said that people could reach you to do a discovery call. Can you tell yes, me? Yes. So it's admin 
uh, which is my assistant at PowerfulJourney.com. So that's A-D-M-I-N at PowerfulJourney.com. And so whether it's you decide you want to purchase uh, perhaps books for your team as a wonderful thank you, a gratitude of saying thank you for all that you've done to pivot and and be able to make all these uh, changes happen with given the, the current uh, circumstance. And then also too, if or, or if it's for training or a retreat or a keynote, I'd be happy to support them. Thank you so much again, Kate. This is so a lot for of everyone, um, you know, if you're wanting to connect with me to talk more about heart-centered leadership, um, please, you can reach me at RoxanneDurhodge.com. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit RoxanneDurhodge.com slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.